Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packwell. Welcome to Threshold of Hope, our program where we bring you the writings of Pope John Paul the Great. Uh, before we get to that, I want to mention that today is the Feast of the Triumph of the Holy Cross. And I have my relic of the true cross that was given to me a few years ago. Uh, the reason we celebrate this feast is that in the, on September 13th, in 335 A.D., the Church of the Holy Sepulchre was built by St. Helena. She, while excavating to build it, she found three crosses, and one of them was put onto a sick woman, and she was healed, and that was how they determined that that was the true cross. Later on, in 614 A.D., the Persians conquered Jerusalem and destroyed the church and took the cross over to Persia. The emperor Heraclius went and conquered Persia and brought the cross back. And he was wearing his imperial robes when he came walking with the cross, carrying it in. But the patriarch of Jerusalem told him, you need to dress like Christ. So he dressed like a simple pilgrim and carried the cross and the people came in with him and they brought, returned the cross to Jerusalem. The cross stayed in Jerusalem until the Crusaders lost the city uh, to Saladin, and eventually the cross was given back to the Crusaders who kept it at Akko, uh, or Acre, as it was sometimes called. And it stayed there until Acre fell, and the patriarch took the true cross over to Rome, and what's left of it remains there to this day. So that's, that's the, the tra tracing of the, the true cross. And uh, we celebrate both the dedication of the church and the triumphal return, which was on September 14th, 628. So both of those days are what we celebrate um, and how the cross has triumphed and will continue to triumph. Now we want to take a look at some of your emails. Um, the first email we have, remember you can send us emails by writing to threshold at EWTN.com. First email uh, says, Dear Father Mitch, last Sunday the sermon at the Mass in our parish was given by a lay person. Before she spoke, the deacon gave a short introduction in which he said that this person had just received a master's degree in theology from St. Bernard Institute. On occasion we have brothers and sisters who speak to us instead of the homily. These people tell us about their charitable work and are looking for our support. I have no problem with that. I always thought, however, that the preaching of the gospel from the pulpit was reserved for priests and deacons. Please let me know if I'm wrong on this matter. Dorothy from Albany, New York. Dorothy, I'll let you know if you're wrong. In this case, you are not wrong. You are correct. Only a bishop, priest, or deacon has the authority to preach on, uh, at Mass, not only on Sundays, but also on weekdays. If somebody wants to give an extended announcement, like, you know, say a charitable work, and they want to give a little uh, talk about it at the announcement time, at the end of Mass, that's acceptable. But in terms of preaching the gospel, it must be a, a bishop, a priest, or a deacon. And if you have two PhDs, you still can't do it unless you're ordained. So, that's, so you're absolutely correct. Second, dear Father Paco, I have neighbors who are non-practicing Catholics. Their 12-year-old son has never been baptized. He and I talk a lot, and he's made the decision with the approval of his parents that he wants to be Catholic. I tried to get him an appointment with the parish nun and priest. I was told basically to butt out of his discernment and tell him just to pray. Doesn't he need to be baptized as soon as possible? How can I help with this if I can't get him in to see the priest? I'm very disappointed in them because I thought they were more in line with the teachings of the church. Am I wrong? He really wants to be baptized and wants me to be his godmother and sponsor for confirmation. I don't know what else to do to help him. Annette. Well, dear Annette, here's one of the things I would do. And instead of complaining, which would be a temptation, I mean, I, you have two options. One would be to take him to the neighboring parish and ask the priest if you can get him into RCIA or if they have another program for him. So that would be an, another uh, one option. The other option that I actually kind of prefer is why don't you ask the parents of the boy to go with you and with them ask the priest and the nun 
to get him ready for baptism. And that, you know, he's made the decision. The parents are along with the decision, even though they don't practice themselves. But you never know. This could be one of the things that helps to motivate the parents. And our Lord may be using the priest and the nun to delay for the boy so that the parents can get on board too. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. But I would be pushy enough just to try and get that done. So see if the parents will come so that the, and that, that way the priest and nun will also know that the parents are not being tricked and this is not behind their back, that they're fully on board with this. Uh, that's, that's what I would try to do. See if that helps. See if that helps. All right. All right. Now let's take a look at our document, which is called Vita Consecrata or Consecrated Life. Now, the Vita Consecrata is a document you can get for, uh, electronically at our website, EWTN.com. If you go to the website, then go to the television tab, and then open that up, go to television series, click there, then scroll down to Threshold of Hope. Click on Threshold of Hope, and we'll have the document linked right there under Threshold of Hope links and you can download it into your computer for free. You can print it out for whatever you want to pay for paper and ink, but that's up to you. We are now on paragraph 36, and this is entitled Faithfulness to the Charism. Now, remember, charism is a Greek word, and it means gift, okay? It comes from the Greek word charis, meaning grace. So it's a, it's a gift that comes from God. And the charisms refer to the specific components of what each order is like. So, for instance, Franciscans have a charism to poverty. Jesuits focus their, the, on the charism of obedience, especially obedience to the Pope. And Dominicans are preachers, and that's why they're called the order of preachers, and so on, on and on. So each order has its own charism, and each institute has its own charism. So in Christian discipleship and love for the person of Christ, there are a number of points concerning the growth of holiness in the consecrated life, and this merits special emphasis today. You see, one of the problems that I think he's trying to address in the next couple of paragraphs and this paragraph is that in the 1960s, a lot of the religious orders, and in the 1970s as well, began to focus on being human. And there was a de-emphasis on growth in holiness in order to develop the human quality psychologically, and sociologically. And so what helps in our relationships and what helps in our personal uh, psychological health. But, and sometimes people would say, and I heard this many, many times, that wholeness is holiness. Therefore, there's, you know, work on your psychological wholeness and you'll get holiness. Well, not necessarily. Some very sane people can do very bad things. So you can be psychologically whole, but you can also, you know, be a real fool and commit sin, even if you have psychological uh, sanity. So it's not the same thing. And that's one of the things he's trying to call us to is, you know, not that he's against psychological wholeness. That's a good thing. <laughs> Being insane is not a goal. You know, being healthy is a good thing. So I'm, I'm in favor of it, and I want to go on record as being in favor of sanity. So let's, let's start there. But we also want to grow in holiness, which is something else. And we'll talk more about what it is. In the first place, to, to seek that holiness, there is a need for fidelity to the founding charism and the subsequent spiritual heritage of each institute. 
So for somebody to grow in holiness as a Jesuit, it's very essential to follow the insights and the spirituality of St. Ignatius of Loyola. For a Franciscan, it's necessary to follow St. Francis. And for a Dominican, St. Dominic, and so on with the other founders. And, for instance, a Jesuit who does not want to be in obedience to the Pope is going to be in conflict with the founding charism of the Society of Jesus. And I speak of the Jesuits because I am one. And a Franciscan who wants to drive a Lexus is going to be in conflict with the charism of St. Francis. And so on with all the other different, not that Jesuits are supposed to drive a Lexus either. Don't get me wrong. So this is paying it, knowing the charism and following and fidelity to it. That's key. It's precisely in this fidelity to the inspiration of the founders and the foundresses. An inspiration which is, which is itself a gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit gave those gifts. For instance, Ignatius was found, you know, founded our order during the Reformation. And the gift of obedience to the papacy was precisely the gift that we needed and the church needed. So it's a gift of the Holy Spirit. And the essential elements of the consecrated life can be more readily discerned and put into practice more fervently. Now, here's one of the reasons. You know, the, uh, what are the essential elements of consecrated life? Poverty, chastity, and obedience. But to do so in a Jesuit way requires knowing St. Ignatius of Loyola. To do it in a Franciscan way requires knowing St. Francis, and so on. So that's going to be very uh, essential. And everybody who belongs to a religious order needs to be very ca- uh, careful to take a look at that charism and be faithful to it. Fundamental to every charism is a threefold orientation. So what are the threefold orientation of all the charisms? First, charisms lead to God the Father. Okay? And how do they do so? In the filial desire. Remember, he likes this word filial. It comes from the Latin word filius and filia, meaning son or daughter. So a filial desire means to have the desire of a son or daughter who relates to God like a son or daughter to a father. Okay? So that's the, the kind of desire that you have to seek his will. And he uses filial desire as opposed to a slavish desire. We're not called to be the slaves of God, but the sons and daughters. And so as sons and daughters, we have a desire to seek God's will through a process of unceasing conversion. Conversion away from doing our own will so that we can do God's will. Wherein obedience is the true source of freedom. And so when I'm obeying my superiors about things, that's when I have real freedom. And chastity expresses a yearning of the heart that is unsatisfied by any finite love. So as as great as the love between a man and a woman might be, still it leaves something missing. There's still something beyond that love between a man and a woman, and that's the love of God. So as deeply as a husband and wife love each other, the love of God even supersedes the love between a man and a woman and makes that love holier. Well, by being chaste and being celibate, we are saying that that love for God is something that um, is the ultimate desire. And we are trying to live that ultimate desire, and we forego the finite loves of spouses, of husbands and wives. And poverty nourishes that hunger and thirst for justice which God has promised to satisfy. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, one of the Beatitudes reads, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. If I keep trying to fill myself up with lots of possessions, 
then I might try to satisfy that hunger. Whereas living poverty, where I don't own anything, and I'm dependent on, on the order, and I, and I just do without a lot of stuff, gives me a hunger that I can then shunt over toward a hunger for righteousness for myself and for the world. There needs to be a, a, a hunger for righteousness, and with that hunger, you're going to want to do something about it. So that's where poverty becomes a, a very, very positive thing. Consequently, the charism of each institute or each order will lead the consecrated person to belong wholly to God. Remember, what is the number one commandment? To love the Lord your God with your whole heart, mind, soul, and body. So that's one of the goals, to belong wholly to God, to speak with God, to speak about God, as it said of St. Dominic. You know, that was one of the things when they canonized him. They said all he wanted to do is talk about God or talk to God. That was the desire. And that's what Dominicans should be imitating, you know, that great desire of his. So that the religious can taste the goodness of the Lord in every situation. That's going to be one of the things. And that's, again, from Psalm 34. O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy is the man who takes refuge in him. So that tasting of God should be the, a quality of consecrated people. Second, the charisms of the consecrated life also lead to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. God the Son. Fostering an intimate and joyful communion of life with him. So we should love Jesus. That's one of the things that, you know, if you knew Mother Angelica, you knew that she did what she did because she loved Jesus. And remember how she would start off her live show and say, we're going to talk about Jesus. And this, that was just her way. Well, this should be the way of every religious Every religious should have that sense of communion with him and prayerfulness by which you're in communion with Christ. In this, and you do so in the school of his generous service of God and neighbor. So that there is this love of God that you see in Jesus, and by communion with him, you live out. But also a love of neighbor, which is the second commandment that Jesus, our Lord, taught us. Thus, the attitude of consecrated persons is, as we see in uh, the, the document Orientale Lumen, that which means Light of the East, by Pope John Paul II, the, the, the uh, and that's paragraph 12. It's an apostolic letter. And it says that this gaze progressively conformed to Christ, thus learns detachment from externals, from the tumult of the senses, from all that keeps man from that freedom which allows him to be grasped by the Spirit. So this detachment from things, you know, that you love God more than the things of this world. You're attached to Jesus more than to the things that you have around you. That is one of the goals of the, of the charisms of religious life. And that's what you should see. As a result... Consecrated persons are en enabled to take up the mission of Christ, working and suffering with him in the spreading of his kingdom. That should be one of the things. If you're detached from the things of this world, you are attached to serving Christ and spreading his mission, which is the salvation of souls, so that nobody goes to hell and everybody goes to heaven. That is our mission. That was Christ's mission, so that everybody would go to heaven and no one would go to hell. And you don't do it by making pretend games, all dogs go to heaven. It's by conversion to Christ and faith in Christ and faith in the power of the cross of Christ. That's where we're going to see the, our mission. Finally, every charism leads to the Holy Spirit insofar as it prepares individuals to let themselves be guided by the Holy Spirit. Again, if you're detached from your own will, and from doing your own thing, you will be open to what the Holy Spirit wants you to do. That's one of the goals. And you'll also be sustained by the Holy Spirit. 
A lot of things fail. A lot of, you know, any number of times, Mother Angelica would be presented with the possibility of catastrophe of this network. There are all kinds of situations where, you know, I'll never forget one time she called me up to come help because the bookkeeper had moved a decimal point and we owed $150,000 that was due the following, in one week, we had a week to get $150,000. So she called me down to come and do a, 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 what do you call it, a fundraiser. And I was singing, dancing, telling jokes, anything to get a few bucks. <laughs> Father, <laughs> also other people are doing the same thing. Um, and so, you know, this, but in the midst of the, that kind of crisis, the Holy Spirit was able to sustain her and all of us to keep on plugging away. And sure enough, we got the 150 bucks by the end of the week. But, you know, these kind of crises occur. And we're also sustained and guided both in the personal spiritual journey, because each person is on a spiritual journey, and you're trying to make your way through life to get to heaven. So that's a journey to heaven. It's a pilgrimage to heaven. But also, we're guided in our lives of communion and apostolic work. In other words, in our life with the whole church, because it's not just the Holy Spirit and me. It's, it's also the whole church with me, and I'm with the whole church. And also, it's not just me sitting back on a journey to enlightenment. It's apostolic. I'm about this work of saving souls and helping people in a wide variety of ways. Sometimes it's through teaching. Sometimes it's through social work and all sorts of things. So the apostolic work is another way where you get guided by the Holy Spirit. In order to embody that attitude of service that should inspire true Christians every choice. So if you're really going to be a Christian, every decision you make should be one of uh, true service and service to others. In fact, it is this threefold relationship which emerges in every founding charism. So uh, every charism of every order and every institute has this threefold character of being oriented to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Always is Trinitarian. Though with specific nuances of the different patterns of living. So for instance, there's one group called the Resurrectionists. They focus on the resurrection in their preaching. The Passionists Focus on the passion of Christ and his suffering. And so on with the different orders. So they're all going to have their own nuance, but it's still always going to lead back to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. This is so because in every charism there predominates, as we see in uh, a, a document called uh, Mutue uh, Relaciones, uh, which was one of the church documents, in paragraph 51 you can get from our website. Uh, it said, to pronounce judgment on the authenticity of a charism, the following characteristics are required. First, its special origin from the spirit, distinct, even though not separate, from special personal talents, which become apparent in the sphere of activity and organization. So that's the first thing. So each individual has their own talents, but the order has its own charism as a group. B, a profound ardor of love, to be conformed to Christ in order to give witness to some aspect of his mystery. So again, the resurrectionists have a desire to preach the resurrection. The passionists have a desire to preach the passion of Christ. The assumptionists preach the assumption of Mary, and so on. C, a constructive love of the church, which absolutely shrinks from causing any discord in her. Sometimes I've heard some religious say that they feel more committed to their religious order than they do to the Catholic Church. That's nuts. That's nuts. First of all, you're a Catholic. Then I'm a Jesuit, a Franciscan, a resurrectionist, and so on. So it's that love of the church, and each order is meant to complement the needs of the church and help build up the church. That is our task. That is our goal. All right. Well, we're going to take a little break. 
because we finished that paragraph, we'll uh, come back and talk to our uh, studio audience to see if they have any questions, and then continue on with paragraph 37. So please stay with us. Thank you, thank you very much, and welcome back. Um, we have a nice group of folks, a pilgrimage group from Philadelphia area, uh, and, and you know, the greater Philadelphia area, including New Jersey. Uh, and we've got individuals who have come here from the Republic of Texas and other states. Uh, so it's great, great to have all of you here. And if you can come and join us, we'd love to have you. Uh, again, for me, it's a lot more fun when you're here. Uh, because uh, just getting to meet you and interact with you uh, makes the program a lot more enjoyable for me. So if you can come here on pilgrimage, whether as an individual or a family or with a pilgrim group, please contact our pilgrimage department, and they will help you with information where you can stay, the scheduling for the masses, the TV programs and tours. Did you get a tour yet? Yeah, okay, good, good, good. And then also let you know where you can go get fried green tomatoes and all the other significant uh, restaurants right here in Arndale, Alabama. So uh, come on down and contact our pilgrimage department at 205-271-2966. 205-271-2966 or go to the website www.ewtn.com. And just to let you know, um, like I said last week, we were almost uh, full up from our pilgrimage to the Holy Land, and we are full, all right? So that we started a waiting list, but uh, uh, so we'll just, uh, I won't make any more announcements about it, but um, I'm look, still looking forward to going. Uh, it'll be a lot of fun to be there for, for Christmas again. Uh, but if you don't get to go, you can always go to my website, and we've got some videos from the Holy Land. At least you can watch it on video. Uh, then we can stay home as well. So, I, and that's just the same website as the other, fathermitchpacwa.org. All right, let's get some questions from our studio audience. Ma'am, where are you from? I'm from Milford, Pennsylvania, Father. Great, good to have you. And what is your question? Well, um, beginning your statement, we talked about being whole and holy. And in order for God's people to be holy, we need holy priests. And unfortunately, sometimes we fall into churches that are all about us churches, right, right. feel good right. kind of churches. Right. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm afraid that that's the case. And the idea is that sometimes, um, you know, the, well, for instance, in psychology, one of the, uh, they don't believe in sin, right? Except the sin of making somebody feel guilty. <laughs> and so, you know, one of the, the one of the psychological uh, concerns, concerns of not making people feel guilty uh, was passed on in some, inside some church circles. So we should feel good about ourselves, then we'll do good things. Well, you know, I'm not against feeling guilt. Guilt has helped me change my behavior for the better. When I am guilty, guilt emotions are not help, helpful. Guilt feelings are not a healthy thing. But, you know, real guilt for real misdeeds, is important. And that's one of the problems. A lot of people who are criminals uh, don't feel guilty. Well, that's not good. You know, they, they feel very good about themselves. You ask some of the guys in prison, and they didn't do a thing. They didn't do anything wrong. They deserved what they, you know, got, not as punishment, but as what they stole, or whatever it might be. And so uh, there's a certain need for guilt feelings. And it's a false psychology to try to just make everybody feel good. So we need to have a good sense of balance and good common sense. And I, I think that there's more sense in a lot of the tradition. You know, if we learn how to mine it correctly, 
using some of the tools of psychology. Now, again, I'm not against psychology by any means. It's very useful. But it's a tool. It's a good, uh, it's a good tool. And it can only do so much, like any tool. You, don't, you can't use a hammer to fix a car engine, all right? You know, that's, my dad used to call them hammer mechanics. Not all psychological concepts are true, and not all psychological concepts are ap applicable in every circumstance. So that takes discernment, too. So we should be balanced, balanced. Yes, sir, where are you from? I'm from Washington, Michigan. Great, good to have you here. And what's your question? Well, you talked in the beginning how the church made changes in the early 60s. And it seems like since the church has eased up on their some of their rules and regulations and things it it seems that the people have more people have left mm -hmm. our church and yet the church made it easier for us right why, why has that happened well here here's one of the things there the church did a couple of different approaches one was to give people a little more freedom. For instance, meat on Friday was imposed on everybody. What the church said is that you can, you know, for some people, eating fish on Friday was no penance. Giving up, you know, meat in order to have lobster is not a penance. <laughs> and so what the church said is you choose your own penance, but everybody's supposed to do penance. But that part got lost. The translation of the, the change of the rule to adapt. For some people, it would be giving up a cigarettes on a Friday. It would be much more difficult than giving up meat. And giving up coffee or something like that would be more difficult. So, you know, that's one of the things that, you know, the, the church was trying to ad ad help adapt to the modern world. But in the explanations, a lot of things got watered down. And the church never changed its rule about missing Mass on Sunday being a serious sin. But some people began to teach that you don't have to go to Mass on Sundays anymore. It's not a mortal sin. And that wasn't what the church said. So you've got to distinguish what the church actually said from what people picked up on. That's why I've been going through these documents so that people understand, here's what the Vatican Council actually did say. Here's what the church actually did say. And that's different than what you may have heard from the pulpit or from the classroom. Because especially in the classrooms, people would, would water things down. And of course people left. If we don't stand for what it means to be Catholic, why should other people? Why would, why would you bother? If, if being Catholic is just about being a nice guy, you can be a nice guy over at a local bar. Right? You know, it can be polite at a bar, if that's all that it is. But it's not about being polite. It's about going to heaven or hell. That's what the issue is. And that's one of the things that we have to remind ourselves that the Vatican Council did say and that this is what is at stake. So that's why we have to go back and recover it. And that's, I think we're in the process now. The, the headiness of the 60s and 70s and 80s has sort of left us flat. Now we're discovering and picking up again. And the church is growing again. And it's really cool to see. So that would be my opinion. Yes, sir. Where are you from? A Yardley, Pennsylvania, Father Mitch. Good great, to have you back, Joe. Great to see you. And my question for you tonight is, um, in the midst of uh, developing an attitude of service in a consecrated life, how important is it and what part does it really play to, to play out the great commandment to serve one another or to love one another as our Lord calls us to do? Well, this is essential. You know, we, we, we have to uh, have that, that, that great commandment to, to, to serve others and to do so, as it says in the Golden Rule, to, to to do to others as you would have them do to you. You know, so this is going to be, you know, one of the things that we have very much in mind. And that's one of the things that John Paul keeps bringing back. You know, that it's not only about a spiritual life up in the ether. It's not just about a spiritual feeling. It's about also the very concrete reality 
of serving other people. And that's, uh, that's going to be key. It's going to be key. All right. Now, we were talking in the first half of the show about how important it is to be faithful to the charism, all right? Fidelity to the charism. Now, he wants to give a balance to it. And that is what he calls creative fidelity. Now, those of us in the audience who are Americans are very familiar with this. You know, if, if you're in the military, and it's in our, mil our movies about the military, that you're supposed to obey your superiors, but at the same time, they want our guys to be creative in how they handle the circumstances of battle. Any good soldier in any army knows how to be creative and respond creatively. If you just do only what they told you, instead of using a little innovation and some common sense, you know, they're not going to do so well. So that's one of the things that we have to do in religious life as well, that we have to be creative in our fidelity. So institutes of consecrated life are thus invited courageously to propose anew the enterprising initiative, creativity, and holiness of their founders and foundresses in response to the signs of the times emerging in today's world. You know, this is a very important thing that in, in the modern world, you know, well, in the world, when the world was modern 500 years ago, St. Ignatius was very creative. No other religious order had its own printing press. He got one. And when he sent our men on the missions, they would raise money to send printing presses over to the Americas so they could print books in the languages, not only of Spanish, but they would learn to, you know, again, they came across so many Native Americans and tribal groups who had different languages, and the Jesuits would write up dictionaries and grammar books. They would learn the languages and make grammar books for those languages and then print books so that people would be able to understand the catechism in their own language. And they could teach it to the missionaries to come after them. So you adapt and you be creative. And, you know, today we see many, well, again, what is, look at Mother Angelica. You know, she saw the need for Catholic television because she saw an anti-Catholic television show. And so in the face of an anti-Catholic blasphemy against Jesus Christ, which she saw on TV, she said, we're going to do something to show the love of Jesus. That's, that's going to be her response. So we have to deal with the signs of the times and be creative. And now, for instance, EWTN is doing work on YouTube, which I don't know how to get to, but we've got creative young people who do, and all sorts of other things using the Internet. This invitation is, first of all, a call to perseverance on the path of holiness. So that's one of the first things. You've got to persevere in holiness in the midst of material and spiritual difficulties of daily life. You know, daily life is not easy. Nobody's life is easy, I don't think. Sometimes there are easier times than others. But everybody's life is full of things that are drudgery. You got you know, you to take the garbage out every day. And everybody's life has to deal with, you know, pain, sickness, death. You know, this is part of life. And so we have to learn to deal with that. And, and then opposition. You know, we have people who oppose the gospel of Christ. So we've got to deal with that with these spiritual material difficulties of daily life. But it is also a call to pursue competence in personal work and to develop a dynamic fidelity to their mission. So, for instance, Mother Angelica herself did not know how to run a camera, but she didn't need to. She found some young men who built the original studio and said, do you boys think that you can learn how to run the cameras? <laughs> <laughs> One of them is still here at the network after all these years. And, you know, that, and they learned. She, she wanted them to be well-trained, and they learned the, the great skills. 
And the people who have come here since then have become quite skilled, and I have the highest respect for the folks that run camera, and work in administration, and do all the work here of directing, producing, and all the other technical things that I have no clue how to do. But all of us have to be involved in that kind of competence in personal work, and a dynamic fidelity to the mission. The mission is not about my personal success. The mission is about winning souls for Jesus. And we have to keep that as a dynamic relationship to that mission. Adapting forms, if need be, to new situations and different needs. So traditionally, uh, I, oh, I did what was traditional for us Jesuits. I taught high school and I taught college. But when the need came, Mother Angelica was too sick to do the programs. I was given permission by my superiors and assigned to come here, adapting my teaching skills for a new circumstance and a new medium. That's, that's the kind of adaptation that, that they're talking about doing here in new situations. In complete openness to God's inspiration and to the church's discernment. So there's going to be personal inspiration to the individual like Mother Angelica, along with discernment by the church. And she submitted, you know, to the, to the Pope. I mean, she got to meet the Pope and a number of times. And <laughs> there's a great line. Pope John Paul said, Mother Angelica, she very strong woman. <laughs> he sized her up right away. <laughs> But, you know, you, you could see that his approval of her, you know, came right toward the, and, and toward the end of her, her last shows. He sent her a great big monstrance to put in the chapel up in Hansville, you know, to show that he wanted her to continue on that mission of Eucharistic adoration and to complement the work that she did of starting this TV network. And... And so that's where the church's discernment comes in. But all must be fully convinced that the quest for ever greater conformity to the Lord is the guarantee of every, every renewal. So if you're going to have true renewal, then you should be more and more conformed to Jesus. You should be acting increasingly like Jesus. Now, do we act perfectly like Jesus at the outset? I don't think so. You know, we have moments, flickers of acting like Jesus. And hopefully those flickers take flame and eventually you act more and more like Jesus. But it takes time. And, you know, a Mother Angelica and anybody else would be the first to admit that there were also flickers of the self that would come in too. You know, so that would be part of the reality. But that seeks, but the, the renewal of a religious order is always going to seek to remain faithful to the original inspiration of the Institute. Now, again, he quotes Vatican II here in the document on religious life called Perfecta Caritatis, paragraph 2, where it says, the adaptation and renewal of the religious life includes both the constant return to the sources of all Christian life, the Bible and the Church's teaching, and to the original spirit of the Institute's and their adaptation to the changed conditions of our time. So, again, originally, St. Ignatius founded my order to be a missionary order. But as it became clear that the need for Europe was for schools, he allowed our first fathers to found a series of schools. And in fact, we ended up founding the very first school system in the history of the world so that all of our schools used the same system of, of teaching, the same books, the same courses, and the same progression, so that if you went from one Jesuit school to another Jesuit school, you only missed a couple of days that you were traveling. Otherwise, your classes were exactly what, where you'd left off in the other school, because they had a systematized way of, of teaching at a time when Europe was breaking up its Christian identity, the Jesuit schools, were there to give back Christian and Catholic identity through teaching the same faith. 
And so that was how he adapted, even though that was not the original. The original idea was to go to uh, Jerusalem and preach to the Muslims. But the ships, because of war, they couldn't get there. No ships were going over there. So they adapted. And they worked in parishes and then started schools. As well as then going to the missions as well. In this spirit, there's a pressing need today for every institute to return to the rule. So that's one of the things he wants all of them to do. Every religious community has its own constitutions. So go back to those constitutions. In fact, that's one of the things that my own order has called us to do. My provincial wants us all to take time to meditate on our constitutions so that we stay faithful to that source of our, our Jesuit life. Because the rule and constitutions provide the map for the whole journal, journey of discipleship in accordance with the specific charism confirmed by the church. So that's the, the rule for each order is adapted to the specific charism of each order. And that's why you have to go back to the rule. A greater regard for the rule will not fail to offer consecrated persons a reliable criterion in their search for appropriate forms of witness. So you need criteria. If you're going to adapt, you have to know when is an adaptation so off the mark that it becomes not adaptation but aberration. You don't want an aberration. You want authenticity. And this is something for all of the orders to deal with is by going back to the rule. And, and yet at the same time be, fav- be capable of responding to the needs of the times, deal with the needs that we have, because we do live in a changing world, a world that's changing very quickly, without departing from the, init- the initial inspiration of the order. So maintaining that balance. And it's the same thing. You know, when you're married... Are you the same as you were on your wedding day? No. You keep adapting, though. It's the same person, and you're faithful to the same person, but each, each of you in a marriage has grown and matured, God willing. <laughs> and you adapt to those changes. And if somebody gets sick, you adapt to that. If somebody loses a job, you adapt. If they change jobs, you adapt. When you have kids, you adapt a lot. <laughs> and then when the kids are, are grown and out of the house, you adapt again. You know, this, well, religious have to do the same. Adapt to the changing times while staying faithful to who you are. It's the same process, same process. All right. Now, he gets into paragraph 38 with the issue of prayer and asceticism and deals with spiritual combat. This is very important. Because too many people have the attitude that the religious life and spiritual life is very nice. It's all very pleasant. And it's just growing from one good thing to another. Well, not so fast. Because there is also a lot of spiritual combat. Because we have enemies of holiness. There are people in our culture who are enemies of holiness. And there's a, there are evil spirits who are enemies of holiness. So we have to deal with our own self. Because I can be an enemy of my own holiness because I'm selfish. I have to deal with the, the culture that opposes my holiness and the devils. So let's take a look at this. The call to holiness is accepted and can be cultivated only in the science of adoration before the infinite transcendence of God. The only way you can grow in holiness is if you adore God. When you realize he's transcendent, that is, he's greater than we are. He's beyond any of our limits. He's beyond the limits of the universe. And the universe is just something small inside his ken. And so we have to adore this God in order to grow in holiness. And here, 
the Pope now quotes Orientale Lumen again, a, a, an apostolic letter that he wrote, paragraph 16, where he said, we must confess that we all have need of this silence filled with the presence of him who is adored. So let's take a look at this piece by piece, that we need silence. And there are, there are a couple aspects. First, in theology, so as to exploit fully its own sapiential and spiritual soul. What does sapiential mean? It, mean, it comes from the Latin word sapientia, meaning wisdom. So theology has wisdom in its soul. And that's, it's, it's the wisdom about the things of God. And so we need theology. Don't, you know, theology is not going to save you, but it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. And it helps us understand our faith. And it has a soul that is wise. And knowing theology can help to make us wise and spiritual. Secondly, it's also in prayer we need silence so that we may never forget that seeing God means coming down the mountain with a face so radiant that we are obliged to cover it with a veil, as Moses had to do in Exodus 34, verse 33. And so, you know, we, there, there's going to be a sense that our prayer needs silence. And we have to, in prayer, meet God face to face. And it's, there's a certain covering of ourselves and of our faces so that we, we keep much of what happens in the silence of our prayers to ourself because it's so deep. And that our gatherings may make room for God's presence and avoid, avoid self-celebration. Sometimes the liturgy is what you were saying before, that sometimes the liturgy today is about celebrating ourselves we are the light of the world. We are the kingdom of God. Gather us in because we're this, we're that. We're doing this, we're doing that. And God, do you realize how lucky you are to have me worshiping here? Do you appreciate it? Just give me an amen, God. I mean, that's practically what we're saying to him with some of these hymns. And that's not the idea of silence and prayer. But rather we avoid self-celebration and put ourselves in worship and presence of God. Silence also in preaching, so as not to delude ourselves that it is enough to heap word upon word to attract people to the experience of God. So it's not just going to be in the, the fancy words we use or as became popular in telling a lot of stories or telling jokes. That's not going to be it. It's going to be speaking the truth that comes out of a silent meditation on the word of God. And that the homily comes from that. And also in commitment, so that we will refuse to be locked in a struggle without love and forgiveness. So that we are going to be committed, and that means I love the unlovely, and I forgive the sins that are done against me. He goes on. This is what man, in, in Oriental Lumen, this is what man needs today. He is often unable to be silent, for fear of meeting himself, of feeling the emptiness that asks itself about meaning. Man who deafens himself with noise, lots and lots of noise. You can't get in an elevator without noise. All believers and non-believers alike need to learn a silence that allows the other to speak, that is God. And how, when and how he wishes and allows us to understand his words. We need to take time in silence. And sometimes, frankly speaking, you know, we have to make sure that we're not doing so much praying and so many words in our prayers that we don't give God time to speak. Sometimes we do devotions. Well, this visionary told me to do these prayers, so I do them and I say them. But I'm not giving God time to, to be, for me to be silent and me to listen to God. That's one of the things that, that we have to, to pay attention to. So in practice, this involves great fidelity to liturgical and personal prayer, to periods of mental prayer and contemplation, to Eucharistic adoration, 
and month retreats and spiritual exercises. These are the kind of things we need. And may God bless you by this holy cross in the name of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.